In November of 2013, we had a small group of anglers embark to an unknown reef system in the middle of the Gulf. What we found was something very special. The fishing, the people, the wildlife, it was probably one of the most unique trips that any of us have ever experienced and it's going to be really hard to replicate. The schools of Buffett, there's two, three hundred fish in these things. I mean, they're giant. And uh, it's, it's the most unbelievable, pristine thing I've ever seen. That's, they look like the heaven, baby. It's a paradise here. This is so beautiful. When we went to the Scorpion Reef, Sandfly was the man. He coordinated all the logistics on the ground, not as a guide, but as a friend. When your friends step up that big, you have to reciprocate. Hey Mike, this is Pat, a uh, friend of San Felice. He's a little concerned about uh, his trip to Alaska, about keeping warm. I think he wants me to tell you to bring some neoprene waders for him. He'll be happy, he'll stay warm. <laughs> Call me if you <laughs> get a chance. I know you guys are leaving soon. Talk to you later, bye. My grandfather first took me to Alaska when I was a teenager, and in many ways, that trip changed the course of my life. Throughout my 20s, I spent as much time as possible traveling throughout Alaska. The bulk of the traveling took place with good friend Mark Rutherford, who has, at this point, achieved almost father figure status. We explored lakes and rivers and creeks. There's something really gratifying about going remote in the wilderness and getting as far away from civilization and people as possible. So when deciding on a place to take Sandfleet, Alaska was really my, my first choice. In particular, there's a tundra river that I've fished quite a bit with Mark in the summer, but we never fished it in the fall. The upper reaches of this river are, you know, big meanders and big bends, lots of down timber and just prime, prime mousing country which is something I've been dreaming about since we first fished this river eight years ago. One thing about fishing around the salmon runs, the, the game fish really tend to key in on, on the spawn. They're looking for that high protein that goes along with the salmon. And by going when we don't think there'll be a ton of salmon in the upper river, we think we'll have our best chance to fish primarily top water. When you find a place that nobody goes, there's usually a pretty good reason. In this case, they're there's two pretty good reasons. The flight into the headwaters is a little tight, which means you have to pack light, and there's a little bit of a hike. Flying uh, and myself, we have this problem. Uh, Xanax, hello, like, needs some medication. Biotti, on the other hand, is just absolutely fine with it, and, you know, death as well, but um, I'm not. I saw a pond and figured there was no way that we would be landing on that pond because it was the smallest pond I had seen since we took off and uh, definitely had a, a little bit of a meltdown. We were extremely limited by weight. We packed, we unpacked, we repacked. Mike, do you think it's reasonable to get three pounds out of your boat bag? We had a meeting about what we could cut out. Yeah, it all depends on what you guys want to do with the gun situation. I like to have a gun in my tent. We cut out all the extra gear, two pairs of socks, cut the handle off the toothbrush. We had to go in light. And I didn't really understand the gravity of the pack, unpack, repack, until we popped out of the fog bank and saw the greasy little tundra pond that we had to land on. And then the whole thing came into clear picture, how serious this drop-off and extraction was gonna become. I, I consider myself pretty good at reading people and Biotti's a very good friend and he, and he always had this kind of like smirk when talking about this portage and you know, he's in Bend, I'm in Victor, so I didn't get to see the smirk until we got to Alaska. 
So this is the ultimate bait and switch. You know, Beatty telling us about how great this trip's gonna be. And we get out there and it's really just a death march is what it is. It's a death march. I'm not, I'm not in marathon shape, um, but I definitely did a little more before this trip. Uh, you know, I mountain bike, I row. Um, I'm in pretty decent shape. And uh, I thought I was gonna be ready for this portage, but what I didn't realize is that Biotti <laughs> me. <laughs> I should have known better. You know, RA loves to just say, it's no big deal. It's gonna be fine, don't worry about it. And then you get there and it's like, you know, a 15 hour drive across the desert road with no spare tire. It's uh, a 12 hour portage with no bug spray. You know, you, you name it, it's, uh, it's a rodeo all the time. It's, uh, it's harder than it looks. For accomplished anglers to be in a place that has been fished only a handful of times in history is just an incredible honor. The team that is here today had to work really hard to get here, but now that we're here we get to enjoy spectacular unpressured fishing. When the guys told me the friends told me, okay, we'll be fishing with, with mice. Mice? These fish eat mice? My dream is to, to fish all these species in Alaska. Oh, it would be great, but if I use a, a, a mice, oh my God, that's my dream. The grayling fishing on mouse patterns was, it was kind of ridiculous. You know, 18, 20, 22, 24 inch grayling eating mice on the top. I mean, it's pretty spectacular. It was amazing. We'd lose count every day about how many grayling we would land on a mouse pattern on the top all day long. He's releasing a brown trout and he wants to catch a grayling. <laughs> Good scoop, Mikey. Yes! <laughs> yeah, the mouse, baby. Yeah. That is awesome, dude. Look at that. The rainbow fishing was pretty awesome. It was definitely a little slower, I think, than what we thought, but that's what you get for, you know, fishing with mice. some of these old growth rainbows. You want to talk about spots on a fish, it's like an artist's dream. I mean, you have respect for, for seeing just one of these fish. I saw this place in Discovery Channels, in magazines, you know, but never, I never thought I would be arriving here in Alaska to fish. It's so exciting, it's so beautiful to do that. Today, I caught my first big rainbow. That's so beautiful. But the weather is, oh my God, that's horrible weather. I'm wet. And hold my body. I came from the warm weather and oh, that's tough, but everybody's cool. Well, I went from having a uh, straight summer flippy tan to uh, middle of Alaska with weather feet, so feeling pretty good. A couple of days in the same pair of socks. Uh, we don't have a lot of food, and today we didn't have food, and we found the food. 
which is incredible char. So let's try some. That is seriously good fish. Oh, that's good. This tastes like this tastes like fish. <laughs> yeah, my back. That's part of my back scare me, you know, because I'm casting the whole day and I sleeping here just in this small mat here. But that fishing, baby. We will see how it will be tomorrow. See you. The end of the day, I fell asleep and I had a dream, a lucky dream. I dreamed I was in my, in my island, whole bush, in my home. I was fishing for baby tarpon in the mangrove zone and I, and I found tarpons everywhere, everywhere. And any cast I, I made, I hooked the tarpons, jumping, oh, it was so beautiful. I saw tarpons everywhere, hundreds of them. I woke up and I saw the weather is so beautiful now. That will be a great day today. This is a lucky dream. There literally isn't a cloud in the sky, so everyone's pretty fired up. Maybe we could spot some fish. One of my dreams is to see the sockeyes, you know? We walk on the river and we saw the sockeyes everywhere. And I told the guys, okay guys, I need to catch one of these. No, no, no. And they say me, they say me, no, no, no. You don't need to catch that fish because they are, they are, they are dying, you know? He would catch any, you know, any fish any way possible. And we said, you know, if you're gonna catch a sockeye, then at least catch it on a mouse pattern. I, we talked with the guys and this, and they were laughing about me. You are crazy soundly because they don't take dry flies, you know? And I was casting, I strip, and I saw one sockeye follow the fly, and the sockeye ate. Boom, said it, baby. And I told them, what did you say, baby? What did you say? And I landed that sock. It was so beautiful. It was actually really cool because he was just as happy to catch a sockeye than he was to catch a 30-inch rainbow. If it's a new species of fish, he's all about it. They attack like a barracuda. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, brother. The relationship with Samfly is is actually something that I I'd actually would have never expected. It has to do with fishing, but it really has nothing to do with fishing. It's you know it's transcended beyond that. It, I grew up in Princeton, New Jersey. I live in Victor, Idaho. He's a Mexican national in Isla Holbosch. We both are passionate about fishing, but what's even better is that he's an excellent human being. He's the brother that I never had. The concept of the, the top water mission in Alaska became our mission, and you start thinking about, you know, grayling, rainbows, silvers, char, pike, sockeyes. I mean, it's, it's kind of a pretty tall order, but he did. After being completely spoiled by the fishing, we decided on the last day we'd have a little tournament. Everybody had to tie one fly from things they found around camp. Then each person would get five casts. Most fish wins. Had these earplugs from the, possibly the scariest landing of my life. Quite the creation working here. Yet to be named. Something to do with earwax maybe? or sand fleas snoring. Oriental snack mix. One thing about coho salmon is they love oriental snack mix. Can I borrow your sunglasses, Mike? The pill I take when I, I want to go sleep, a deep sleep. The name of this fly is good, good, good for nothing fly. Oh, that's not enough to tie the hook on. Well, what I'm looking for in this competition is the creativity of the tie that each angler put together. 
along with the size of the fish that they catch. Now it's half Cheeto, half Stash. It was no surprise that Sandflea won. It was the perfect ending to an incredible adventure. Now there was only one thing left to do, shoot some guns.